Good morning and welcome back to yet another much awaited session uh, of the annual fellows meeting. Uh, for this session, we have two exemplary and illustrious speakers, uh, two of our Margdashi fellows who are going to entice us with their talks. First on stage is Professor Akhilesh Pandey, uh, Margdashi fellow at Nimhans and Kidwai Memorial Institute of Oncology and also with an affiliation at Mayo Clinic. We look forward to hearing his talk on, uh, on his journey towards establishing a center for molecular medicine at Nimhans. Over to you, Akhilesh. Thank you. Uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here and talk about uh, where we stand at the end of three years. And I just wanted to talk a little bit about why is it called a Center for Molecular Medicine. It goes all the way back to 1987 when I was one year away from graduating from medical school at AFMC Pune. And what I realized was we were doing anecdotal medicine and we were doing presumptive diagnosis of tuberculosis, malaria, diarrhea, dysentery. And my mind was not that type. I liked objective evaluation where I needed to be sure. And luckily one of my classmates convinced me that have you thought about doing a PhD? And I said, okay, that meant my dad selling the first Marathis ever sold in the country, and I got out of army, although I was a hardcore army types, and then I went to Ann Arbor, Michigan to get a PhD. But this idea was that the future of medicine would be molecular. We need to understand what happens, why it happens, for us to make a bigger impact. So here, through this, I got an opportunity to try to say how our our future effort, if the future of medicine is molecular, or at least one of the futures of medicine is molecular, how are we going to contribute to this? We need to build that as a system. And I have to start with thanks, because Mark Darshi program had just changed some of his guidelines, and I, had, uh, I read them, and I read them over and over again, and I was still stuck because I had two major problems. One is, I was in the US, and I was going to stay there. I was at Johns Hopkins until very recently. For 16 years, I was there. And I was going to stay there and yet spend part of my time here in India. And the other thing is, I had already started many years ago uh, a nonprofit research institute, which has about 50 people in Bangalore, called Institute of Bioinformatics, which is a systems biology institute. And I thought it would be taken against me. So one seminal meeting with Shahid Jamil and I asked him, do you think I'm eligible to apply? And he said, you never know, but you know, you should, he encouraged me to apply. And I think I had the toughest interview with the panel and I thought this was the end of the world. And then, you know, I said, okay, that's, that's fine. I don't get it. My family gains 25% of my time. <laughs> they will be happy because they were not going to go back and forth. I come back and forth. But then as it would have it, I got it. I'm very thankful to the committee that they placed their trust. And what I want to show you is how we are walking towards establishing that Center for Molecular Medicine. So I want to also thank all of the staff, and they have been very, very helpful. I've been brought to tears many different times, but I also want to tell you the chronology. So in July of 2016, I was funded. The money was transferred, more than a million dollars, sitting in the bank for six months. I took a sabbatical from Johns Hopkins. I came to Bangalore, and I was sitting there. I have never had this much time where I was twiddling my thumbs doing nothing. And that brought me to tears. So what you may or may not know is Shai Jamil also does psychotherapy. So I had to call him and, and I had to say, you know, how do you help me out? So life went on and I, I thought I knew about India. I grew up here. I knew the system. I had operated back and forth. What I didn't know is how many of the institutions work. Where if you order a chair, it has to, now I understood the real meaning of through proper channel. That chair has to be ordered, <laughs> ordered through the director. How do the directors have time in the world to actually see a screw, a chair, and every single thing? So anyway, all this meant that 20 months elapsed. I kept writing my dummy updates because I had to tell chronology-wise, the lab is not operational yet. We are getting ready. We had hired people, but in February of 2018, all the instrumentation, including the mass spectrometer, it all arrived. So what you are seeing is a progress of about 14 to 16 months. So you have to bear with me. And you will, I hope you'll agree that we are well on our way 
to change the paradigm. And one of the important things for me was, in order to do this bio, the most biomedically relevant research and translational research, you need to be in a hospital. It's a passion of mine. You heard from Dr. Bang, go to the people. But here, go to the patients, but also go to the cutting edge physicians and others who are fighting every single day. You may have gone to medical school 20, 30 years ago, and even that medicine is changing. You need to know how people are being treated today. So I said, forget everything else. We need to be in a hospital, and we chose Nimhans and across the street, Kidwai. So I would like to thank many uh, of the people. So uh, I like to again highlight uh, outside the country, you all know this, but I still cannot get over the fact that the government of India is so generous. If you are almost any good, they will fund you. They, will, they have so many postdoctoral programs. They have so many programs for students who get PhDs in those labs. So Welcome Trust provides funding, but there's also the flexibility. So we can hire some folks under the Welcome Trust umbrella, but then use the money for consumables, because we have assembled a team of people who are doing molecular biology, proteomics, computational biology, molecular biology, microbiology. And I would especially like to point out three individuals here uh, who are doing their PhDs. She's an MD in pathology, and these two are MD in biochemistry. She uh, d has done stem cell work, and she has done cancer biology. So all of these people are now sitting there. We have, because we are there, now we can say, Dr. Satish Girmaji, he's a psychiatrist, neurologist, microbiologist, neurologist, geneticist, cancer biologist, and microbiologist. Now we can go there and start to use the power. And I think what I want to highlight is we all say 1.2 billion people and all that. But I think the clinical acumen of the physicians in India, what they are doing in a few seconds and minutes, because the lines are so long, you cannot beat. And I'm going to show you how that pays, plays back into the science. We also have many trainees on loan. So we are just trying to say, uh, I think I'm not a business guy. These are some terms that business folks use. But the word leverage, I don't like it, but I'm going to use it now. We are trying to leverage whatever we can to take these funds and make them that. We want to transform the system. And the way we are doing that is, so he, uh, Nimhans has a program where they have MBBS and MDs who are doing their PhDs. So he was working with the psychiatrists. We take them over, and we start to work with them and make them do molecular things with us. So they are big bridges with the other clinicians. He is with a neurologist, Dr. Paul. Uh, she is uh, with uh, another neurologist. Uh, he is uh, working in a genetics lab. They, so these are all MBBS PhDs. Uh, she's a PhD working in a microbiology lab, and he's also in a microbiology lab. So again, so we have a lot of firepower, but you need a place. So what I also learned is you have to fight with the procurement system and the government contractors and all of that. So I have also seen examples where people go to NCBS and they see how they should basically say, this is the model we want. Let's do it at Nimhans. Now, the way the system might work is you may not get what you accomplish. So we basically said, we also want to replicate NCBS and InSTEM-like ideas. And we have tried to build a lab that is somewhat like that. So many of these things, we wanted top-notch. And this is, you know, we have uh, the equipment funded by, uh, all of this is funded by the Mark Dashi. We have mass spectrometry, cell culture, computational stuff, molecular biology. But again, every lab at the end of the day is the same in every part of the world. It's just the people and how you do your science. So the reason I highlighted, I'm thankful to all of them. Now we are in the right setting. We can start to do science. And what I decided to do today was that I will not tell you how we are dissecting one protein, but how we are using this umbrella to try to do translational science. In my last slide, I may have to skip over many. I, I will tell you what are the other things that I won't talk about. I like to think our team as molecular detectives. We have made such major advances in Research, we have technological platforms, but we are not training many of our folks, I think, to be molecular detectives. 
That's, what, that's the term I use. You can say forensic analysis, because most of the time what we are looking at is we are working with things that we cannot see, touch, feel, smell, or hear. We are convinced they are there, a gene. It's a concept at the end of the day. You amplify it a billion times, you see a band on a gel. It's not the gene. It's a, an amplified chemical product. So we need to be molecular detectives here in the context of inherited genetic disorders. And again, some, we have also meandered in that system. Some things take off, so we have started focusing more on those areas. And other things where we had obstacles, we had said, okay, let's cool it. And I think you need to be agile in that way. People know agile programming. We, are, we have to follow agility in our life. And again, the India Alliance allows you to do that. So it's an old story. There is a syndrome which was uh, intellectual disability. So this is work with Dr. Satish Girmaji. And it's a heterogeneous syndrome where intellectual disability is one part of it. Now the reason that experience is so important is it was described four decades ago in a family of three males. It's X-linked. So you have to be a walking encyclopedia. When a kid walks in, they have all these features. You are basically comparing those features with everything else the textbook ever taught, except that here it has been reported in the literature only six times. Only six times. So you got to say, say and Meyer described this. Six families have been shown. It's that one. We cannot do this. Our students cannot do this. We relied on them. And what we are doing is now, OK, what can we do to figure out the molecular cause? So in this family, there were two male siblings. They both have it. Looks like X-linked. We are not sure. So this is clinical assays, array CGH cytogenetics. I think we have to really say we're in the 21st century. Call a technique for what it is. It's a low resolution method. We said. And again, I'm not saying what we are doing is earth shattering. None of what I will talk about is earth shattering. It's application in that setting, in that way that makes it earth shattering. Nothing, it's all routine. People will say it's being done everywhere, in the country and outside, of course. So these are the two. There's one unaffected. We do the sequencing. We figure out, OK, it is consistent with uh, this. And here, what we are talking about is that there is a deletion of two amino acids. And those two amino acids are very, very conserved in a gene that actually is an E3 ubiquitin ligase. A lot of people have done a lot of molecular biology on it. But just doing that molecular biology does not actually give us predictive power to say what will happen in a human. That's the truth. So exome sequencing says it's an unsolved mystery of four decades. It's an X-linked. It's a splice acceptor site. And as you can imagine, so it's a, it's a one base pair change, exon skipping, two base pairs deleted, two amino acids deleted. If you had exome sequencing data, you would ignore this. That's why you need to sit down together and build a team. But now this mutation, now that we have published this, it will help other people not ignore it. This is a big problem in all genomic analyses. So that is one case. The other one that I chose as an example is that there is a set of disorders where kids are born, and it's called Mendelian, meaning inherited susceptibility to mycobacterial diseases. And I'll come back to mycobacteria in a different context, but you've got mycobacterium tuberculosis, but many other mycobacteria. What's happening is they're born with this immunodeficiency, and they have severe and recurrent infections caused by virulent mycobacteria, code word for mycobacterium tuberculosis, but many others which are also mycobacteria. And you can imagine diagnosing these conditions may not be easy. Again, you need to work with experts. If you look at genetic basis, there are many genes that are known to cause it. Autosomal dominant, autosomal recessive, X-linked. All over the map. So genetics won't tell you just following the family. So this is a tragic story. Two kids, you know, BCG vaccination. It's universal in India. You give the kid, and to piece it together may not be so easy because kids may die for all kinds of reasons. The clinicians have to interpret what the heck is happening. In this case, even though it happened two times, now people are on the alert. They may or may not know what is happening. Third child has some symptoms. Initially, look at this. This is still modern medicine. They are being treated for dermatitis because that's the symptom. 
molecular basis will tell us where is the problem, what we have to do. They figured it out. We have a research project that is going on with this and the fourth child. So here what we have done is this is interferon gamma receptor has receptor 1, receptor 2, and both of them are known in this case, except the mutation that we find is this one base pair change. Again, it is in a splice acceptor site. You, here there are three amino acids that are being deleted in the extracellular domain of this subunit of interferon gamma receptor. And that is tied very intimately into the biology of tuberculosis and other infections. But this mutation was not reported, and again, you would ignore it otherwise. So these two kids, so we have a happy ending. They've undergone a bone marrow transplant with their dad. And, uh, so, and this is uh, this particular form. We have a homozygous. After bone marrow transplant, you can see there's heterozygosity in the blood because now you have a bone marrow transplant. But I think from now on, anybody identifies these. It's very important for genetic counseling. We have just begun. Now, I think we have shown to the system and to our own people. I showed you the list of trainees. We are sitting in a gold mine. Although theoretically, we know what all we can accomplish. But I think we still need to periodically brainwash ourselves or people we work with. So now our young folks are excited, including physician scientists. Now we have collected, again, these are world experts who have been doing this for a living. Luckily, they're collecting some samples, not all. 81 families with young onset Parkinson's disease. It's a craze to study to find the young onset. If you have a population of 100 million, not easy. 5 million, forget it. You got a large population, but well-trained clinicians, now you will get those. Five families with familial Parkinson's, again, not common. Four families with late onset ataxia, 15 families with movement disorders with suspected mitochondrial problems, five families with and familial and mini sporadic neurodegeneration with brain ion accumulation. Again, very specific entities. They have been cataloged, they are sitting in the repository. We need the funds, but I think what's the most important part in all this is, and that's why I think outsourcing many of your analyses to some place where they'll just spit out something, whether or not they have one medical or clinical geneticist who can sign reports, is not the answer. The answer is we have to have an interdisciplinary team. People have molecular tumor boards. Those are becoming more established in academic medical centers. Not that most places still have them. You have got, here you've got to have neurologists, neurosurgeons, psychiatrists, radiologists, geneticists, bioinformaticists who understand genes, proteins, and everything else that's going on in the patient, now we can bang our heads to say, it could be this, it may not be this. There are too many possibilities. It's easy to say exome sequencing. Actually, you're banging your head on every single case, so we need to have this. It's ready and in place so we can do all of this. Center for Molecular Medicine. I'll just change gears. One of the things across the street, gastric cancer, there was a paper that just came out by a team from Korea. They have looked at gastric cancer. They just published a cancer cell paper. They have looked at 100 different cancers. At the end of that, it took them, it was a national pride for them. It took them 10 years to do it. They spent many, many millions of dollars. At the end, I've hired the first author of that study. He's in my lab there now. They have accomplished nothing because we love to molecularly characterize and say, yeah, this is, we just see observation. But the main thing is, gastric cancer is a killer. And I told you, I'm very proud of having those physician scientists on board. One of them is this pathologist. What people are not paying much attention to is this entity, which looks very different under the microscope, intestinal type and diffuse type. When you dig into this, these are the two commonest subtypes of gastric cancer. One of them occurs at a young age, more common in women. The cells are not sticking to each other, and they infiltrate the stroma single cells. That's what you saw, poor prognosis. So one does much more poorly than the other. We do not know the molecular basis of this. Who is solving? When you go and look at TCGA, name the study, people are so proud of saying gastric adenocarcinoma, if they will say that. But they are not looking at the molecular subtype, which for me is different. We need to think of them as different entities, and pathologists have always known this. But it's just that research is getting, in my mind, increasingly also disconnected with clinical medicine. We need to always be talking. Sometimes bioinformatics people take everything and run away without talking to the rest of the team. It's not just saying any clustering will give you three subgroups, but we need to be rational about it. So we have 
started exome sequencing, RNA sequencing, protein analysis, glycoprotein analysis, and kinome analysis of these samples. We have hundreds of samples. These are the early results. I won't bore you with the, the details, but I just wanted to show you that we have already found molecules, proteins in this case, by proteomics, which are upregulated only in intestinal subtype with no association in the literature to or only in the diffuse type. You could say there is no targeted therapy for these types. So they could become potential targets. We have also done, used chemical tricks to look at N-linked glycopeptides and many of the tumor markers, as you know, ovarian cancer is a great example for that. They are sugars on proteins. So we are now saying we can do genome-wide. We can find thousands to tens of thousands of glycopeptides. And we want to look at who is more in one or the other. It could be either a hook that we can target on those cells, or it could be biologically driven. So this is to show that, yes, there are big changes in this case. And we can find some significant hits. But the bottom line is that although we can say we have done some things, we are just starting, and what I'm really sad about is, and I could not report this to you, for me, the one thing that I'm the most passionate about, we have not done yet, which is activated kinases in these two subtypes, because there it gives you a straight shoe-in to molecular therapy of each subtype. There is no targeted therapy, so it's, it's important for individualizing medicine, and this work can come out of India. It's happening right here. Another, an ordinary day at Nimhans, somebody comes, they have problems, people are st still thinking what is happening there. You look at their MRI scan to try to figure out, and of course it's a series of steps, and they say, oh, there's an abscess. There's an abscess, people start to think about this, let's try to grow it, they quickly figure out it's not bacteria. So they do microscopy, they do culture, they also get CSF, they're looking for clues to figure out what it is. And here I'm going to talk about uh, more infectious types of things. But in a special medium that is used, and this is the uh, way it looks, there are these colonies that they look like yeast. Gram staining. So what I want you to remember is just like diffuse and intestinal, the looks are not going to tell us what it is. And we will come back to this theme again. So it's basically a failed identification, and it was sent to a referral lab at PGI, and they take three to four weeks minimum to tell you what it is. So after 40 days, it was identified as cutaneous trichosporin, also known as trichosporin, by PGI 20 days later. It took some time to work up here, about three weeks and three weeks from them. So total time, 30 to 40 days, and we think we know what it is. But what we decided was, as a research study, the day the abscess came, we said, I want to prove that in one day, we can get the identification. So we started doing genomics, and we started doing proteomics. And in 20, so this is just showing you how the sample was split. It's not going to be used for clinical reporting. In 24 hours, we nailed the problem. One single run on a high-end mass spectrometer where we are sequencing the peptides, we could tell that this is cutaneous trichosporum oleaginosum, okay? I won't bore you, but these are the kinds of data that come out. It's a mass spectrum of the peptide. We are sequencing hundreds of peptides. But if you eat meat, and if you're eating a burger, and you got to really say, is it goat, or pig, or beef, or some other animal, how will you figure this out? And I don't leave people in my lab until they can just recite in their sleep that really the only way we can identify it is we need the genomic sequence. And they always fail because they think, oh, we are doing proteomics in the lab, so the answer is proteomics. And I say, you fail. DNA, the genome sequence, will tell us what we have. So here, there was something that was lingering that was bothering us. Because we had these hits, but they didn't explain some of the data. So what we're also doing is, this is bedside nanopore single molecule sequencing. We have hundreds of thousands of reads, and we could take that, and this can be done very rapidly. People use it for Zika virus in Africa, nature study. We can do it in Bangalore, right here. 
And now the story became different. So we were not sure, so we said, let's do Illumina sequencing, let's bombard it. After the bombarding, what we find is, we have 24 million reads from a culture. Now this is not the sample, this is the culture. Only six out of 24 million reads are mapping under whatever parameters you choose. And then we say, okay, what we were thinking, cutaneous trichosporin, that species, it was not identical. It, it was similar, very, very similar, but not the same. So now we realize, okay, we're talking about one case, one clinical case. We have just discovered a new species. Same genus, different species. A lot more work is ahead, but what we have done now is these are our computational people. Again, new species, a new draft genome, 53 MB. Genome predicts 12,000 genes. You have to do that at that stage, but proteomics doesn't predict here. We are using that sequence, and we have done RNA-seq also. So we are now pushing forward for this. So what have we accomplished, really? So this is the kind of a title that our paper would have that we have done whole genome sequencing and proteomics to figure out we have a new species, all coming from one isolate. So you can see where we are going. India is the TB capital of the world many, many years ago. I don't know if you have heard of this place called Chengalpattu in Tamil Nadu. As a medical student, I was very proud. Chengalpattu trials, BCG was proven to be very useful in this condition, and yes, TB capital should do something. But I think in many, many intervening years, I think we lost the edge. We still are the TB capital, but I think this title is not really making me proud. But what can we do with what samples we have? And I'll just remind you what exactly happens. Uh, it happens every single day at every single hospital. People are assessed for the most common form, pulmonary tuberculosis. You have an x-ray, there's something suspicious, something that is cavitary might be this. And you take the sputum, and you do what is called acid fast staining. It's a messy process. Technicians in labs do it. So it is acid fast. That means if it's resistant to acid in this decolorization step, then what you have is this. Acid fast bacilli are there. It doesn't tell you it's mycobacterium tuberculosis, what you want to know. There are many other related mycobacteria, atypical mycobacteria. So the real definitive identification is, and now that definitive is wrong, DNA will tell us, other things are almost getting there, but you have to do a shortcut which takes 10 to 15 days, and LJ slant which takes four to six weeks, six to eight weeks. So you've got to wait for all that time, and then you're still not done because you need to do drug sensitivity. But people start presumptive treatment when they have, uh, this I think I want to highlight. In India, this may not happen in many other places, people will start Presumptive treatment, which takes six to nine months. Six to nine months of treatment, the day they see this result. What also I won't tell you, but I just am going to tell you, you will not like it, is even if this is not seen on clinical suspicion, because clinical acumen is important, and I rebelled against this because I thought clinical acumen should be valued, but it's not everything. Sometimes you can be younger, and you may have better ideas, and you may be right. So if you don't grow anything, you can still treat, and that's the physician's prerogative. But six to eight weeks, what we are saying is take the sputum, let's go to town as molecular detectives. Never done before experiment. In the sputum, you've got human cells, human protein. We are taking that, we are sending it through the high-end mass spectrometer, we are sequencing peptides, and a technician has to go through to look at acid fast bacilli. We can say, oh, there are all these peptides that are coming that correspond to MTB peptides. And we can distinguish based on the peptide sequence whether it is typical mycobacterium tuberculosis or many of these atypical mycobacteria. So we have identified mycobacterium tuberculosis based on these proteins, which are specific for mycobacterium tuberculosis not found in the others. What about genome sequencing? Well, we d use those technologies and Negative samples were negative. These are negative by culture, so we are using them as our control. You saw it, but you didn't see it, so let's go back. There was a question mark. We have 1,000 reads that map to MTB in one sample that's labeled negative. Every single day this is happening. That is actually a TB case that was missed, and we have identified this. So again, we need to improve diagnostics. These are positive samples. 
And one of them did not, was not positive by smear, but it grew out. So again, and we are taking the one that was negative by smear actually is positive by whole genome sequencing. And again, like I told you, this is not rocket science. You know you can do this. But it's just application of that technology. Another day at NIMHANS, you are looking at these images after a lot of workup to try to say, is meningitis, maybe it's tubercular, maybe it's cryptococcal, maybe it's bacterial, maybe it's something else. So how can we confirm the causative diagnosis? So we said, we need to go direct from specimen diagnosis is not a common thing because of the human contamination in all these samples. I want you to understand before you will realize why am I excited? These are new ways of doing things, not done before. So what are we seeing? These are MTB CSF from patients with MTB, but when we look at what we got based on our analysis, this is not tuberculosis. So we go and start reading now. I had never heard of this organism. Now we say, oh, 1991, there was a paper, Chimoide. Then there's another paper now. Now it's becoming an emerging mycobacterial illness, which has a completely different drug resistance profile. So this patient actually does have mycobacterial tuberculosis, has something else that is being talked about in the world. A lot of attention is being focused. How did we get to it? When we were trying to use it as a positive control to say, okay, we can find it. So we use proteomics and genomics to identify these. And I think this is important. People are talking about, there's so much talk about single cell sequencing and all that stuff. Clinical application. That's the power of mass spectrometry. DNA is even more powerful. 10 cells, mass spectrometry, we can identify. We know these are bacteria we have diluted as a synthetic experiment. 10 bacteria and we can say, oh, many proteins, many peptides, what we have. We can do now, we have done the same with CSF for other organisms, because what we want to say is, can we do a differential diagnosis? Often you don't know what is the causative organism, but you are sure they have meningitis. And yes, there are some differences in clinical profiles. So here, again, we can say we are taking many of these samples. We have found cryptococcus. Now we are saying let's do whole genome sequencing. Let's continue to do proteomics in that context. So now we start to do, these are our initial pilot experiments. Look at the one in red. These were cryptococcus samples. They were culture positive reported as cryptococcus. It's candida. We all know from the spelling, candida is not cryptococcus. It's very different. Treatment is different. This is what our being molecular detectives told us. And now you're saying, oh my gosh. What is happening? What I want to remind you is, I don't want to scare you. This is happening, it's true. I didn't make up any of the data. It's happening every single day. Every single day, in every single lab, at some level, some of this is happening. We are in the 21st century, we need to do things better. We already have these methods that many of you are using routinely in your kinds of experiments, changing the field. So, but as you walk out of the room, don't tell people about this. Because these are pilot studies, we are going to expand the scale, and we now need to say that these methods that I'm claiming as a research tool are giving us an output that we didn't have actually work when we do a test drive on hundreds to thousands of samples, and deploying in clinical practice is not that easy. And one of the reasons I moved to Mayo Clinic was that they have something called Mayo Clinic Labs, where they love to develop new diagnostic techniques, and I'm a pathologist, and I want to do everything in my power to make this more objective. And these molecular tools are getting us there. And this is my last slide. Things I didn't get to tell you about. Thank you for listening and in this time, but I think this is a lot of the other exciting stuff that is evolving. We already have data on some of these using CRISPR to make models for neurological disorders and cancer to study genes where we don't understand them, but you can use CRISPR. And we have all the molecular tools to study signaling, including mass spectrometry, iPSC generation, 
uh, for, again, you can choose. And something that we uh, are known for is developing new methods. And I heard some talks about protein-protein interactions. And this is a newer way to look at protein-protein interactions that by uh, proximity dependent by translation. And finally, uh, one uh, you hear a lot about circulating tumor DNA. It's all over the press, New York Times, Nature Science. What you hear less about is something that already is an FDA-approved test, which is circulating tumor cells in some cancers. Breast cancer is a major one, where the simplest thing that you can do with circulating tumor cells is count them. How many are there? And that is actually guiding treatment. But what we want to do is we want to do genomics of that. We want to understand we can grow them and we can do drug responses. And thank you for your attention. Thank you, Akhilesh. Thank you, Akhilesh, for sharing uh, very interesting data and also your experience.